But today's a fascinating conversation. I'm joined by someone who has been making waves all over the news uh, because of uh, some of the things he's been doing in Arizona. He's a he was he just uh, dropped out, but he t- we're recording this on the day of the um, of the race for Arizona Senate, the voting day, uh, and uh, he's the founder of the Live and Let Live Revolution, a global movement. He's also an attorney, criminal justice attorney. Uh, attorneysforfreedom.com is his law firm. With that, Mark Victor, how are you, sir? I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me, Dave. I appreciate it. Great. And I wanted to have you on because, uh, you know, we had interacted a little bit and um, I'd done an article about Blake Masters on a few different outlets and you saw it on Lou Rockwell and uh, it was also on American Greatness. So we had a few different people that picked it up. But what was your uh, initial desire to reach out? Well, I thought that uh, things were inaccurate in your article. Uh, in fact, I have it here in front of me. I was actually kind of surprised uh, to see you describe me as an out-of-touch libertarian candidate who wanted to use the opportunity to bring attention to the idea of lowering the age of consent. Um, I think I was misunderstood uh, substantially in the debate that I had with Blake Masters and Mark Kelly. I think a lot of libertarians sort of flew off the handle. I wish some of them had reached out to uh, talk to me before they sort of flipped out and uh, generated a big uh, to-do about a comment that I think is 100% consistent with libertarian theory. The first thing I would note is I said nothing uh, about lowering the age of consent. I certainly don't take that position. Uh, The only thing I said uh, was that uh, age of consent, like many other issues, Uh, such as the abortion question, such as uh, what constitutes a substantial risk of harm to another person, or many issues where reasonable minds can disagree. And when I say reasonable minds, I mean reasonable libertarian minds uh, that are absolutely committed to what I used to call the non-aggression principle, and I now call the live and let live legal principle, If uh, those reasonable minds can disagree, then what I'm saying is that that particular question within a reasonable range of choices should be submitted to the local community to make that decision. Now, fair enough, this was a sort of an offhanded comment in a uh, a very short debate where I got very, very little time. So um, and, and also another point here. Uh, I didn't, I was completely unaware of whatever controversy has uh, occurred in the past, and I'm frankly still unaware of it. I understand there was some controversy that happened in the past with libertarians, with a libertarian apparently making an argument to lower the age of consent. Uh, So I didn't know anything about that, uh, nor do I take that position. So anyways, I, I read your article and I thought that was an unfair characterization of my position. And that's the reason I reached out so we'd have an opportunity to correct the record. Yeah. So I said it to, I said, despite an attempt by Democrats to fund an out of touch libertarian candidate to spoil his chances, Blake Masters represents an opportunity to build a family focused liberty movement with broad appeal. So, yeah, I didn't know much about you before I saw that debate. And I just took it from my first impressions when. Uh, you know, I saw that part where, you know, you had mentioned that. I know you were just giving an example. I don't I didn't say here you're an advocate, I don't believe. Let me see here. I'm just rereading the the article. I said the that the lip that the LP candidate would use the opportunity to bring attention to the idea of lowering the age of consent reminded me why that party has so far failed to resonate with millions of Americans with liberty instincts. Now I'm not saying you're endorsing it, but you did bring attention to it and you use the opportunity of a debate to do so. So nothing I said there is actually factually incorrect. No, now, I, I disagree with that, David. Uh, what you said was use the opportunity to bring attention to the idea of lowering the age of consent. I didn't say any such thing about lowering the age of consent. Nor right, but, do you I said, that. but you said that reasonable minds disagree or agree on or disagree on this matter. Yes, so you, I, brought, I you, right. you opened the Overton window for that topic that no Arizona voter was thinking about. You brought attention to the idea that it could be lower. They weren't even thinking about it at the time. So you did bring well, attention to it. But that's fine because that's not your position. You don't want to lower it. 
but you did bring attention to the idea that you can lower it. So that's actually what you did. You introduced and an opened up the Overton window to a topic that no Arizona voter was interested in dealing with. So you well, absolutely did that. But that's not I know I didn't that wasn't your intention to make that your main campaign issue. I didn't say that. I think it was just a little out of touch. It was tone deaf. When you're on a debate stage and you got a chance to go against two parties, I know maybe it was just a mistake, but don't bring up that topic. That has nothing to do with the interests of the Arizona voters, and that's why it was out of touch. Well, the reason I think it was a valid comment is because we had just been on the heels of talking about the abortion question. And uh, my position on the abortion question is that that's an area where reasonable minds can disagree, like the age of consent. In fact, uh, there is no more similar issue, right? Because uh, the issue on abortion is the question, and I'll, I'll for your listeners, I guess I will use the non-aggression principle, is the question of whether the non-aggression principle applies at all to the unborn baby. The age of consent question is very, very similar in the sense that it, the issue there is the question of when does the full protection of the non-aggression uh, principle right. apply and, and, and what, to what, adults? But the problem you made there is that like Libertarian Party candidates tend to do, you thought this was time for like high school or college debate class when you're dealing with Arizona voters who are getting absolutely ravaged by inflation, by all kinds of things like insane wars that could break out a nuclear conflict. So you don't bring up these esoteric, obscure philosophical debates that are not the pressing issues of the voters when it's time for prime time. Now, I'm not going to press you on that because... I get it. It just came to your mind. It wasn't like you wanted to put that on the table. I get that. I'm fine with that. But it did happen that way. And that was the optic of it. And I responded to that optic as out of touch. But I know that you didn't want to make that a big issue. You didn't want to advocate for that issue. I get it. You see what I'm saying? The point I made optically, you're talking about politics. You're talking about you got five seconds to make an impression on people. And you brought up that as a reference, which frames people, you know, you're, you're introducing them to a high level college debate or something. And the average voter is just trying to say, wait a second, this Federal Reserve, they don't even know about what the Federal Reserve is really doing. Most of them, they're now learning, but they're destroying my currency. I can't pay gas. Crime's going crazy. You know, I'm, I'm a victim of uh, a potential insane foreign policy that could lead to nuclear annihilation. There's bigger issues than philosophical debates about age of consent. And you brought that up as an example, which was out of touch, in my opinion. I stand by everything I said, but I'm excited to learn no more about what you've been doing in Arizona. Yeah, just two quick points before we move on from that. Number one, uh, I don't want people to assume that I was uh, aiming my remarks at the average voter. That is not my goal. I don't think that uh, politics uh, is the way to change things. I'm trying I to change the that. world. Yeah, I'm trying to that. change the world. And so I'm speaking to uh, maybe somebody who would understand the more important nuances of what I was saying. I'm trying to spark a global revolution. And then the second final point I want to make here um, is really this issue was blown up strictly by libertarians. It was the libertarians who made this an issue. Uh, I can tell you uh, I got an avalanche of comments that were very pro of things I said in that debate from non-libertarians. So I guess what I'm saying is that uh, if the goal was to attract non-libertarians to the libertarian philosophy, I think the debate was a great success among non-libertarians. Now, libertarians who are suffering from the past, I guess, positions of libertarians arguing to lower the age By libertarian, of you're meaning the libertarian party people? Yes. Yeah, I'm not a member of the Libertarian Party, so I don't know what that whole Under, Understood, is. understood. Yeah. But anyways, it was what it was. I, I wish that the pro-freedom crowd, I'll say more generally, the pro-freedom crowd yeah. would, would uh, extend a tad bit more of courtesy to the other members of the pro, pro-freedom crowd just to reach out and say, hey, what did you mean by this? How did you characterize yeah. it? How can we support each other? rather than tear each other apart. We're here, to, we're, we're here to support what you're up to. We want to know more about what you're up to. So that's what okay. we're doing this for. So tell me a little bit about your work as, a, as, a, uh, as an attorney, as someone who's fought in criminal matters in Arizona. Well, the law firm I founded, I call it the Attorneys for Freedom because I only hire lawyers who are pro-freedom in their approach. 
And so we take on, uh, of course, we do, you know, regular cases as well. I do major felonies. I've done many first degree murder trials with the death penalty alleged. I do state federal cases, trial level, appellate court uh, cases. I've been to the Ninth Circuit many times. We've got cases in front of the Supreme Court, both here and in Hawaii. I also represent people nationally. Uh, as well. I even have uh, one defendant as, as a result of the incident in January 6th in Washington, D.C. So we have quite a broad uh, criminal defense practice. But really what burns in my heart is I'm a freedom activist and uh, I do believe in the libertarian philosophy. I think we uh, libertarians have done a horrible job communicating the libertarian philosophy to our non-libertarian brothers and sisters. I take the position that if everybody understood what it is we were saying, then we'd be in the majority, not in the minority. And so Live and Let Live is really an effort to try to spread, uh, really improve the message of the libertarian philosophy by adding uh, a moral principle. I think one of the shortcomings of libertarian philosophy right. is that it only talks about sort of the legal principle, right. the non-aggression principle, and doesn't say anything about morality. And so Live and Let Live as a peace movement, which is, of course, a much broader um, effort than just a freedom movement, we have a moral principle. We describe it with the concept, the phrase, be a good human. And uh, we don't go too far here because I recognize that people disagree. You're, you're, on getting, you're getting the liberty movement closer and closer back to a full picture worldview. That's right. What That's I would right. say, actually, libertarianism is just a der derivation of Christianity. But we can get into that later. I want to get back to this, what you did with your law firm. Did you ever see anybody do jury nullification on your trials? Well, um, you may know that we as lawyers are absolutely strictly prohibited yeah, right. from you mentioning. You can't tell anybody. You can't tell anybody. Yeah, right. Yeah. You can't tell anybody. And I think this is one of the reforms we need in the criminal justice system. Now, of course, uh, this is a reform we need because the laws are not calibrated properly, which is to say we have victimless crimes. If we did calibrate the laws differently, then I might feel differently about that. I might say we no longer need jury nullification other than uh, I would say the very, very rare case where uh, the law, which was calibrated properly, still is wrong. And there are cases, no rule is 100% perfect in all cases. And so for the very, very off cases where somebody is actually initiating force or using aggression, but they're doing it to accomplish the right thing. And again, I think this is a very, very rare circumstance. I think that's an option should be an option but for did a jury. you ever see anybody look like they did jury nullification on a case you were doing? Well, uh, I got to say, I've had, one or two, yeah. I've had one or two drug cases where uh, the evidence was against us pretty strong. And I've advised my client, hey, look, I think we're going to lose. My client has said, look, I got a good lawyer. I'm happy to take it to trial. And, and I've had some uh, egg on my face because we've won. We've gotten a not guilty when we really should have got a guilty. So there are some... Um, cases where I'm, I sort of scratch my head and say, how did they come back with a not guilty here? But hey, we'll take it. And I'm not going to argue with them on that point. But uh, yeah, it's unfortunate that we can't argue for jury nullification. I would argue for that in every single victimless crime. But I think this is a secondary issue, right? First thing we got to do is convince our brothers and sisters, our fellow brothers and sisters to get in their hearts and in their minds this notion that if people aren't aggressing, they should be left alone. That's what's most primary to me. And that's why I think we need to lead with the principles, both the legal principle and the moral principle, rather than sort of start with issues. I think if we start with issues, we lose them right away. If we start with principles, I think we got a good chance of winning hearts and minds. You really think that the average person in the world uh, thinks with first principles as the way that they determine how they're going to vote. I, I don't just, think I, I don't, don't think, think they, they do. do now. I don't think they do now. I don't now. think we can teach them to do that either. Well, I, I hope you're wrong about that. No, I, I think I think it, it's not necessarily what's wrong. I think it's just got to understand the anthropology of human beings. Like, why do we have a state? Why do we have governments? Why do we have governments that look religious? Why do they demand worship and awe? These are things that go back thousands and thousands of years of human history. And this, the, the, the fundamental mistake I have with libertarian philosophy, as I see it presented often, is that it's this idea that doesn't take into account 
the anthropological origins of what we call a state. It doesn't even, it just assumes that we were always these little rational Greek philosopher type people waiting to be educated about our true reasonable destiny. And all we have to do is just become uh, aware of our enlightened philosophical reasoning, and that will make us reason our way out of these things. That's not where the state came from. The, the state came from ritual human sacrifice, ritual cannibalism. You go back to the earliest forms of what we would call a proto-state. And this is a very deeply embedded part of what it means to be a human. And I'm just suggesting that I don't think uh, axiomatic principles is why people got to this point. They got to this point because of their loves, or something in their gut their passions, right? Their aesthetic sense. They want to be a part of a, of a religion. They want to be a part of a tribe. They want to be a part of something that's transcendent, that's awe-inspiring. And I think that just saying, hey, let me just get your facts wrong. Your facts are wrong. Let me correct your facts. Oh, I'll let go of my religion. It doesn't work that way, you know? States yeah. are more like cults. Yeah, and you have to approach it like a cult, and you can't reason with someone who's brainwashed in a cult. Hey, you're, you know, your cult leader keeps telling you don't wear glasses and always drink this Kool Aid. You know, you can't do that. There's nothing in that Kool Aid that's good, good for you. It's bad. I don't care. You know, you're t you're dealing with a, re a religion. <laughs> yeah, I certainly wouldn't take that approach. I think it reads too much into the libertarian philosophy to really stray uh, any further than simply don't aggress. I think that's something that. Uh, reasonable people can agree on as a first principle. In terms of how you get there, what you might say, a truly first principle, right? In other words, why you shouldn't digress, we don't reach that question. There are many different answers to that question, right? Lots of people will cite their religion or natural law, social contract or something like that, or Ayn Rand or economics. We don't reach that question in the live and let live movement because there's no reason to. If somebody takes the position that it's wrong to aggress for any reason, then I would accept that as long as they're being honest about their position and say, okay, this person agrees with what we call rule number one, don't be an aggressor, our legal rule. And that's all I really am trying to get across to them. Right. As long as they agree not to aggress, I'm ha I'll check the box. But how do you, but the devil's in the details on that, you know, you know, because I, I I'm all ab about non-aggression and I, I believe it's non-aggression plus non-vengeance really, you know, that you have to, let go of your right to, to desire vengeance as well uh, in terms of using violence to, to get vengeance. Um, but, but like, how do you, I mean, is, is it aggression to if like, for example, fentanyl, you know, you're taking that fentanyl, if, if say China's really pushing this stuff to try to get back at America and they're, they're doing it as a weapon. You know, if you're stopping people from using fentanyl coming, if you're stopping fentanyl from coming over the border, is that aggression? Or is that defense? Your defense. Well, of, yeah, know. yeah. Well, I think these are good points. And I think you do have to get into the weeds on what you mean by aggression. That right. fortunately for me is kind of the backyard of what I do. Right. Uh, and so I, I would sort of more generally break that down to say, okay, let's talk about what aggression is. It's here are the things that are aggression for sure. Initiating force against another person or their property. That's aggression. And being engaged in fraud. That's aggression. Coercion. That's aggression. Or Putting another person in danger, or as how we lawyers might say, creating a substantial risk of harm against another person. So the question with fentanyl is, look, if you're bringing uh, fentanyl and you're presenting it as a different drug, right? This is drug X, and it's uh, unknowingly laced with fentanyl, and you know that, then okay, you're bordering up on a fraud here. That's certainly aggression. If you're serving this up to a minor, somebody who's not a competent, consenting adult, then that's aggression because minors can't enter into contracts. So I would say, you know, they have guardians and you would have to get the permission of the guardian to engage in the contract with the minor. So, um, yes, I think you can, under most circumstances, deal with what we're dealing with in but fentanyl. What if it's fentanyl nicely labeled as such and said 18 and over and China is still pumping millions and millions of these things over the border? Is that an act of aggression when a, when a state actor is trying to flood a culture that's already dealing with spiraling mental illness and a host of other issues and they're just flooding the zone with all this toxic stuff, but they've properly labeled it. I'm just saying theoretically, you know, it says fentanyl and it's 18 yeah. and up. Please don't take it if you're under 18. How, is that still kind of an aggression there? It's well, I think we got to start with the notion, uh, a couple of things. Number one, that we should hold governments 
and corporations and all people to exactly the same standard. Nobody gets a break. Nobody gets treated differently here just because they're a government. So whether it's a government who's bringing it or another person who's bringing it or a corporation who's bringing it, that doesn't make any difference to me in terms of the analysis. The second question we're looking at is, um, look, freedom means that competent adults own their bodies. They get to decide what to put in their bodies and they may decide. In fact, there are lots of uh, reasons that doctors agree with why you a person might use fentanyl. So they get to make that decision exactly for the same reasons that people during the pandemic might have opted to use hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. They shouldn't have been prevented by the government or anybody else uh, from engaging in that transaction if they were competent adults and they knew what they were getting and they made that decision. So I don't make any uh, exceptions for whatever the particular drug is, whether it's fentanyl, marijuana, or uh, or dairy milk. It doesn't I do think matter. if we're going to have a government, right, uh, that it should have a role in being able to stop another government from flooding the zone of a really toxic, highly dangerous product. It may be, you know, I've changed my view on that. You know what I mean? If it's, if it's, it's, it's one thing, if it's just two true actors independently dealing with something, but when you have these mass scale events where they're flooding, 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 it's just like with this open border thing. This is not something that's just natural flow of humans. This is something that billionaires and NGOs and governments are dumping some of their worst offenders from prison and say, get on over to America. We're just going to th flood the zone. And, and, and there's a lot of billionaires and NGOs that want to have a North American Union type thing. They want to break the sovereignty of America. And this is a strategic foreign policy move on behalf of many actors. So it you, you see what I mean? There's one way where you're like, because I have a friend uh, from uh, Papua New Guinea and she was being attacked by people that wanted to burn her at the stake as being a witch, right? And I said, you need to get out. And she did. She went to Australia and she became a refugee. And I was glad for that. That's That's one thing. But then when it's, millions of people artificially being funnel, funneled into these very coordinated mass migration movements sponsored by billionaires and NGOs with the goal of a political attack against the sovereignty of a nation so that those folks who enjoy the Second Amendment and other things will not have that at some point if a North American union is deciding what, what we're allowed to do. Uh, I think there's a different layer of what is appropriate in terms of defending some of these things, don't you? Well, I, I, I gave it, I start from first principles all the time. And we've, you've, right. you've put a lot of issues on the table. As to the fentanyl issue, it doesn't matter to me if China's sending it or uh, the neighbor is sending it. Competent adults get to decide for themselves what they put in their bodies. If they're not deciding for themselves, they're being forced on or frauded on, or we're dealing with minors, then that's a different situation. As to the immigration situation, look, if people want to come to the United States, and I don't blame them, I think it's probably the best place to live in the entire world. Um, if people want to come to the United States, I got no issue whatsoever with stopping them at the border and checking them for the one thing that we care about, which is, are they coming to aggress? Some people are coming to aggress. And nobody should get to aggress, whether they're inside the country or outside the country. But if it turns out they're not coming to aggress, like the vast majority of them who are coming are coming, because I, I've been representing many of these people for the last 28 years, and their stories are generally pretty similar. They're coming for exactly the same reasons our families came to pursue a better life. If that's the reason they're coming, we should welcome them, but they should get exactly what our families, at least the ones who came in the late 1800s, early 1900s got, which is the right to pursue your happiness peacefully. You don't get the right to live at the expense of another person. So we do have to devolve down the welfare state. Yes, we have to move in a rational, reasonable way to deal with immigration. I don't think we could accept, you know, 20 million people coming in all on the same on the same day. So I think there are times to trend the ways to transition reasonably to a place where peaceful people coming to pursue their interests, which is to trade with other people, are welcomed in America, and we do our best to keep people who are coming to aggress out. I think those are the fundamental principles. How we transition from where we are to where we get there is yet a different question. Is your is your philosophy fundamentally a, a, against a, a world government? 
Yeah, I'm not in favor of a world government. In fact, Couldn't really, you do a all, world government in a way that's less non-aggression or, or more non-aggression. And the only more. thing I care about is that individual people who are competent adults are the iron-fisted dictators of their own bodies, property, money, and time. However, we get there doesn't really matter to me, and so I'm most interested in getting the law calibrated around what I now call the live and let live legal principle. Exactly who's enforcing it or those kinds of things or how the jurisdictions break down is, while still of interest, of less interest to me than calibrating the law right. We got to get well, that. If you're not interested right. in that, could you be used as an, I mean, could that message of, of, um, of, uh, of liberty be uh, co-opted by forces that would rather have a world government? Well, of course, there are there are people. So how do who we don't... not become useful fools for someone well, else's scheme? You let's know just I mean? go slow. Of course, there are people who are happy uh, to pretend that they believe in one message, yet they're acting with another message. We just got to make sure we're not being used in ways that uh, don't further our purposes. Like, for example, uh, in the article you wrote about me, you made, I think, an accurate statement uh, that uh, the Democrats were funding me. Yes, they were funding me. Uh, to some extent, I know I got some Democrat money, but as I said to the Democrats at the beginning, I'm going to do at all times what I think is in the interest of freedom and peace. It is irrelevant to me who's sending me money. I could be getting money from the libertarians, the Chinese communists. It doesn't matter what I'm going to say or how I'm going to act. It won't affect anything. And the same is true no matter who I'm talking to. So we first got to make sure we are steadfast to our own principles. Could we be deceived? Sure, this could happen. Nobody's perfect. I'm an imperfect guy. And as an imperfect guy, I act imperfectly sometimes. I'm committed to excellence. So I try to learn from my mistakes and do better going forward. And of course, we could all be used and, and deceived. But I think first, first order of business is let's get our hearts and minds around these right. two fundamental principles, right? Don't be an aggressor. We don't accept aggression for any from any person, group, corporation, government, for any reason, no exceptions. And then number two, let's just try to inspire people to be good humans. We should have no way to force them think, here. Do you think that there's powerful interest trying to aggress against the concept of an American republic as a sovereign nation? I think there are powerful interests trying to aggress against all other people. There are people who just are. But is that a specific interest of a lot of folks with power in the world to destroy uh, the sovereignty of America? I don't know. I, look, I, I'm sure whatever position we can think of, there are some people who take yeah. that position. No question about but that. But you there haven't are, seen it as a concerted movement that's a particular well, force look, in American there, politics? I don't I certainly don't doubt for a moment that there are people in the world with bad intentions. There are people right yeah. now who would uh, unleash deadly pandemics if they could and, and unleash nuclear weapons and would, would seek to end the human race. So we know there are bad actors. In fact, that's the very reason that we're forming the live and let live global peace movement, right. because what we want to do is unite the reasonable people of the world against these forces and around these two fundamental principles. That's the whole purpose of the live and let live global peace movement to begin with. I was the first lawyer who sued the governor of Hawaii for some of the travel restrictions and That's lockdowns. Yeah. I also brought cases here in Arizona for some of the governor's restrictions on private businesses. That one, we did that pro bono as well. So See, that's we what do I'm talking bring... about. That's, that's the real stuff that gets things done. Yes, it is, but- That's better than I, politics right now. I opinion. think what needs to be done is we need to win enough hearts and minds of our fellow brothers and sisters for the fundamental principle. Otherwise, even a lawsuit, it's just sort of a one-off kind of thing. We got to get people united around basic principles. How we do that? I think we can use politics as a vehicle, just yeah. like I have recently done. You know, being able to speak to groups who wouldn't have heard things we're saying, putting websites up, attracting people's attention, writing articles like you do and what Lou does in terms of putting up his website. So we need to win the discussion. And I, I think we can win this argument if people know and understand what it is we're saying. I mean, to me, the libertarian philosophy, this notion that just it's wrong to aggress, this is something that all reasonable people would agree with if they just simply understood what it is Humans we're saying. Humans are not reasonable when they do crowd behavior. That's the thing that we need to work with you on to get you to see that. that there's, there's something you have to scratch 
an itch that's deeper than just reason here. That's what well, all I'm suggesting. I like what you're saying. I'm just saying you've got to go a little. There's got to well, you got to round that out a little bit because because we're not dealing with something that just oh, I just didn't know. I, I'm sorry, I got my facts wrong. I figured it out now. That's not how people are moving their decisions. They're moving their decisions through deep gut feelings, gut emotions, gut loyalties, like religion. And and if you are not approaching the subject of state violence as a religion. I think we're going to be wo woefully ill-equipped to help people move away towards a peaceful direction. Does that make sense? Well, I, yeah, and I think it's hard to label and just say people, right? Because the people are all different and they're on the spectrum on a bell curve and some are very easy and very rational to have a conversation with and some are completely irrational. So it's very difficult uh, to sort of say the people and then and then proceed from there. But we, But the good news is we don't need everybody. The American Revolution was, it's estimated, was about a third of the people supported revolution, about a third were against it, and about a third didn't care. I think we could maybe get what we need done with 20% of the people. What do you mean uh, get done? Through legislative reform or what? what well, at suggest? the end of the day- What's what your actual- political like approach to this well well step one we've got to win enough hearts and minds right so we get people to to sort of coalesce around a philosophy that says not just state violence is wrong all violence is wrong right whether it comes from the state or corporations or individuals in the subway in new york it's still wrong it's equally wrong no matter where it comes from let's first win their hearts and minds around that idea and then the second idea, which is this moral idea of be a good human, I think is very important as well. We're ever going to get to peace. So that's step one. Step two, once we get that done, we've got to calibrate the laws around that principle. Now, there are different ways to do this. One way is to elect people to office, get the right people in office, and they'll start changing things. Another way, which is the way we got legalization of marijuana, uh, in many states throughout the United States is when the people change their minds, politicians who have been on the wrong side of the issue forever, they start changing their minds. We don't actually have to elect anybody, but we can get done what we want to get done because the politicians who just follow, they follow the people who have changed their minds. So and there could be other ways to get things done as well, too. But those are the ways I would like to see things happen. We need a revolution in thought, right? Just like the American Revolution was. I would certainly uh, want this to be done in as peaceful a way as possible, but as quickly a way as possible as well, too, because I feel that we might be running out of time. We have smaller and smaller groups of people can do greater amounts of harm with the technology we have. That's why I feel an urgent matter for us to get the, what I'll say, the reasonable people of the world. And what I mean by that what it means to be reasonable is to oppose aggression, right? That's the definition of what it means to be reasonable. You can be reasoned with, which means your tool of persuasion is language, not force. Now, all we need to get is, these people together. All this stuff comes from culture, and all of this stuff comes from what I would say Christianity and the biblical influence on our culture. So I would say, I would say start with that fishbowl because it's huge, it's massive. It's been enveloped. It's been developing and influencing our culture for thousands of years, and that would be a great place to to work with people to say, "Hey, what? How would this actually imitate the personhood revolution of Jesus?" That's what I. I well, focus on. I, I can say this just from personal experience. In fact, I do a podcast called "The Peace Radicals," and we've yeah. had. Uh, several Christians, very religious Christians, come on our show and say this live and let live thing you're talking about is exactly what I believe because of my Christianity. But I'll say I've also had Muslims come on and atheists come on. I think there is a general underlying current of reasonable people who just say, look, aggression is wrong. Why they agree, why they agree with that idea really is doesn't matter to me. If they agree that well, aggression is wrong, yeah. welcome to the club. What I'm saying is you're still swimming in Christianity's fishbowl, even if you're a Muslim who, because what we're dealing with in this Western culture is Christianity was the thing that brought to the idea, this notion that religion could be something you choose that's separate from your identity as a member of society. I mean, religion was synonymous with your nation. You know, the, when you... You know, when Jesus was walking the earth, you didn't walk around and say, you know, I'll decide I'll be Buddhist or I'll decide I'll be Buddhist. You know, you are a part of a tribe, you're part of a nation or a, a people, and that religion was synonymous 
with your your cultural identity. And so well, Christianity is the one that creates the concept of the seculum, which is where we get this idea of saying, hey, look, we can have a a a a, a, a pluralistic option for folks to, to decide with their own volition. That's a Christian concept that Christianity brought into the West. Well, for the same reasons that I don't like to label all people, I don't like to label all Christians either, right? Because mm-hmm. there are certainly Christians who are very uh, pro-peace and non-aggression, uh, mm-hmm. and then there are very uh, pro-aggression Christians as well, right? We I'm, have just a talking about what, I'm just talking about the objective history of what the Christian church introduced with the idea of a secular space. That was something that was novel that hadn't happened in the history of... of well, of- to, to the extent that Christians, because of their Christianity, agree with non-aggression or our legal principle, I I absolutely welcome them wherever they're coming from. Mm -hmm. To the extent they disagree, then what I would say is we should try to convince them that uh, aggression is a bad thing. So I I agree that there are things in Christianity that have driven many Christians to uh, embrace the live and let live global peace movement. I can send you some episodes where uh, one Christian came on and made the case that if you are truly a Christian, you should be a member of the live and let live global peace movement. I was very thankful he made that argument, but I also brought a Muslim on to make the same argument as well, based on the Quran. So when you say member, is there like people, a formal membership or you're, are you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you simply go to live and let live dot org, Read what you see there. There's two principles, right? Don't be an aggressor and be a good human. If you agree with those, you check the box that says, I agree. Now you're a member of the movement. Yeah. The, the next question is, what can we get you to do to help spread the word? of? The what do you do when history? you get someone that checks that box and then they say that your speech is violence? That's what the left now believes. They believe that you're it's violent to speak well against their uh, feelings. Well, this is why we try to be as clear as possible in terms of what we mean by aggression. If somebody at the end of the day says, look, uh, Mark, I think that offensive speech is aggression, then I would say, okay, we have a disagreement about what aggression is. You're not a good fit for the live and let live global peace movement. We are we are absolutely free speechers, right? We think speech by itself can never be aggression, but speech, of course, coupled with action uh, can be aggression. And so there can be a gray area there. That's what we lawyers did you, did do. You right? have, did you have success with some of the McWoke people in, in sharing this message in your campaigning in Arizona? Well, I don't know how many, uh, as you refer to them, McWoke people actually heard the message. I would certainly welcome an opportunity to have a have a rational conversation with anybody about these principles. In fact, By I, McWoke, I mean, the corporate leftist kind of vanilla brand that we now are supposed to accept as dominant cultural sense making, which suggests well, that speech is violence. And yeah, you know. I'm happy to defend the position that speech by itself is not violence. What about dead naming uh, someone or, or, or mis- misgendering their pronoun when they say they want to be a Zim and you don't say Zim? Is that violence? Is that aggression? That's not even close to aggression, right? They aggression. say that they say that that's you're denying their very existence. OK, well, all I would say is, look, I wouldn't get into sort of a head banging uh, contest with them about the definition of aggression. I would just simply say that's not the way we define aggression in the live and let live movement. And I would move on. Right. We don't need to convince everybody here, nor is that my goal. And so for somebody who wants to take the position that mere speech is aggression. OK, fine. Uh, they're not a good fit for our movement. That's all. And I move on. I don't think most people take that position. Yeah. What would you say that it's an act of aggression for mentally insane totalitarian ideologies to hijack public schooling for the purpose of brainwashing kids into a violent ideology <laughs> that does say that that misgendering someone is an act of violence? Is that is that a form of aggression? Well, Dave, it's a tad bit of a leading question. But what I would say is running running government schools, uh, which are derived from taxation itself, is an aggression, which is yeah, why. I agree. I support a complete separation of state and school to begin I, I'm with. I'm asking you questions that are, you know, we can get the foundational ones where, you know, we shouldn't have a government schooling, but then so we can do that one. But then we can also do, okay, now that we have it, what are things that we can do to stop further aggression with that system in place? Does that make sense? That was what that question Well, it meant. does. But my personal opinion here is that's not the right approach, right? The right approach to me is to get people first 
to understand the mm-hmm. underlying principle that's at hand and then to reason from that principle, not to start with the, okay, we're going to have some level of aggression here that we're going to keep. And now let's figure out how to best swim in that pond. of. Yeah, aggression. I'm just trying to deal with chopping down the Leviathan in an appropriate bite sized chunks. We can't just, you know, you're not going to get people to agree. Oh yeah. This whole thing is, is not needed. It's going to be, you're going to have to well, take it by bite sized chunks. This is why I support different people doing different things as long as they're moving towards Mm -hmm. the right direction, because there isn't a centralized plan to get to freedom. What I'm doing and what the people in Live and Let Live are doing is trying to teach people and sell them and convince them on two fundamental ideas, a legal principle and a moral principle. If they agree with that, and I think most people do, then we reason from there and we can get everything we want from there, which is a free peaceful and prosperous and civilized society. That, in fact, it's the only way we can get there. There is no alternative path to get to freedom. You have to rid it. You have the freedom is when you outlaw aggression. That is to me, the very definition of freedom. If you have aggression, you don't have freedom. And if you don't have freedom, you can't even talk about getting to peace. Freedom is a prerequisite to peace. So I'm for peace, which means we got to first get to freedom. But you, but you also get into this idea of you have to be a good person, and I think that gets into what the true picture of liberty actually is, which is not just free from external coercion, but freedom from being a slave to the passions, addictions, uh, you know, things that are actually choices that you make. Nobody aggressed upon you, but you can. This idea that I don't want to do the do what thou wilt. That's not freedom, really. It's actually liberty. Is the free is non aggression but also choosing the right virtuous path with that freedom. Yeah, to me, choosing the right virtuous path comes into the moral realm. And we Mm -hmm. certainly do need to do some work in that realm as as well. That's why we have a moral principle. Mm -hmm. But the important takeaway from having a moral principle is that we are not trying to impose our morality on other people. We need Mm -hmm. to convince them. We want to persuade them to adopt our morality, not enshrine it into the law and then impose it on them. I think that's a very important distinction uh, that you can't really be in the live and let live move unless you understand that. That's one of the most fundamental points that we make, the difference between a legal rule and a moral rule. And they're very different for that very reason. A legal rule, you have no option to avoid. A moral rule, you have to be persuaded to follow. Well, Mark, you know, you've made some big headlines again. It's election day in Arizona, so I don't want to keep you, but I, you did say that um, you made a, an announcement that you were dropping out endorsing Blake Masters. I want to get into that a little bit as we as we wrap up here. Um, uh, I, I was able to put Ron Paul's team and, and Blake together, and they turned into that interview that I thought was really good. And I saw that you had mentioned you saw that interview. So tell me how you came to that decision. You saw that interview? Well, I have a lot of respect for Ron Paul as well. Um, That by itself didn't get me there. I said after the debate, when many people asked me to step down, people, by the way, who supported Blake Masters as, as well as Mark Kelly, and I put out a video very quickly after the debate that basically said, look, here's how you get Mark Victor to step down. Uh, have a conversation, an unscripted, a uh, unrestricted public conversation uh, with me and convince me that it's in the interest of what I care about, which is freedom, peace and civility for me to step down and endorse you. That's the only way I'll step down. And so uh, Blake Masters campaign approached my campaign about a week or so ago. And he's, they said, look, uh, we're happy to have a public conversation. I said, great. People can see that public conversation if they go to live and let live revolution dot com. That's my political website. And then at the end of that conversation, I think it's very clear uh, that while Blake Masters and I don't agree on everything. And of course, that's too high a bar. No two people agree on everything. There was certainly enough of an agreement there that it caused me to say, you know what, this guy is much better uh, than what I understand Mark Kelly to be. And by the way, Mark Kelly was free to talk to me as well. Um, but I said, that's what's in the interest of our country and in the state and, and really of, for the world. Uh, and so I stepped down and endorsed Blake Masters because that's what I said I would do if I was convinced that he was more for freedom uh, or enough for freedom to make me feel that way. And, and that conversation convinced me, said a lot of great things in that conversation. Hopefully he means them all. I think he does. And I think he'll act consistently with them when he's elected, which hopefully we find out today he is. Yeah. I mean, I did an interview with him and I, as what I was referencing in my article that you referenced where he had made some uh, commitments to investigate and pursue 
liberty in some areas that I think are very pressing and needed, like getting capital gains taxes off of gold and silver and crypto so people can have a savings account that that's not affected by inflation, you know, and um, having access to food direct from the farmer. These are things that are going to help the average family in a way that I think would be fantastic. And and those were commitments he made to me. So I think that was an effective use of 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 your of your message and in, in your campaign that I think other Libertarian Party candidates should consider too. Because look what you were able to do. You're able to get some solid commitments and 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 obligations of of liberty on the table in a way that actually brought some real uh, change of, afoot. So I think that that actually is a model for other folks. Not that they all have to do what you did, but I think instead of just always running as a spoiler, you could run, get a large percentage of points, say, now, which candidate wants to move in the liberty direction? That's a leverage. That's a good leverage. I, I love it. In fact, a couple of my friends, uh, Jeff Tucker and Stefan Kinsella, each separately wrote articles saying virtually that, that uh, you know, this was a good strategy to not only get the libertarian ideas out there, or now I'll say the live and let live ideas out there, um, but also to affect the conversation. I now have a recorded conversation with Blake Masters, which hopefully I will never have to use for impeachment, as we lawyers say, because I expect he'll do everything he can to get us in the right direction. But I think that's an important thing. I also know he spoke favorably of the Live and Let Live Global Peace Movement, said he would be a senator from Arizona who's a Live and Let Live senator. All that has great value, much better than me pulling five, six, seven, eight percent and then fading off into oblivion like the other libertarian candidates are going to do. But to be fair, I had Blake Masters and some of the other candidates don't have a Republican right, exactly. or a Democrat who's more pro-freedom. That's and why, Blake I mean, that's where the reason why I wrote that article. I mean, if you were running against John McCain, you rest assured, you know, I'm sorry, you know, he's dead now, but so I don't want to be mean. But, you know, if you're running against a Mitt Romney, I wouldn't be, you know, <laughs> you should go full steam ahead, <laughs> whatever, because those guys are globalist, you know, establishment folks. But you're dealing with with Blake Masters, someone who I think could really move the, the ball forward in a way like Rand Paul has done on some key issues, you know? Yeah, I think it's fair to say uh, anybody who would want me to step down and endorse them, I would have a conversation with them and ask them the same questions I asked Blake Masters. I wouldn't prejudge the, the conversation. I would talk to anybody. That's why I said if Mark Kelly wanted to sit down and try to convince me that he's more for freedom and I should endorse him, I was open-minded to that conversation. I think that's the best approach. Let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Let's sit down. Let's talk to them. And uh, if we disagree, let's put that disagreement out there. But if we agree and it's in the interest of freedom and peace and civility, to endorse someone else. Let's do that. It's not about me getting elected to the Senate. It's not about and having an ego. It's about what's best for freedom and peace and, and really the human race. And that's why I did what I did. I think it's, it gets us in the right direction. So any plans for election night here? Well, actually, uh, I got an invite to go to the, uh, the big Republican shindig. And so I probably will go there tonight and hopefully chair Blake on and um, I, I'm going to hopefully have a conversation with him after he's elected. He agreed to have a sit down and I'm going to do my best to try to get him to take as pro freedom, pro peace and pro civilized. Frankly, I think we need a lot more civility uh, in the Senate and, and in government generally and in how we interact with our fellow brothers and sisters. Even if we disagree, it's OK. We should still be civilized and we don't need to call other people names Let's act better towards each other. We're all on the planet for a very short time. I want to try to inspire people to act more civilized. And so I'll do my best to persuade Blake to act in those directions. Uh, and whatever the, whatever the future brings, I, uh, I'm committed to doing whatever I can do to getting us in that direction. Well, very good. I really appreciate your time, Mark Victor. And I want people to check out your website to learn more about your movement, liveandletlive.org. Thank you, sir. All right, David, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.